Hey, y'all, this is your girl, your cousin, Tanisha Peoples, one third of the Talk That Real Shit group. Um, today we're here because I work with a, a, a few dynamic activists around the country, and we have a lot of conversations um, on our various platforms, but we really have the opportunity connect to, to connect the faces to the work. And so we're doing that now in our new series called Activist Spotlight. So today I want to introduce one of our activists from the Bay Area, Mr. Tyson Amir. Tyson, how you doing? I'm good. What's up with you, Tanisha? How you doing? It's good to I'm be good. here. I'm good. You know, we midway through the week, almost to the weekend. So that's a good thing as always. Um, For sure. Yeah. So just to give y'all a little bit about Tyson, again, he was born and bred in the Bay Area. He's a rapper blessed with a poignant message, electrifying cadence, enlightening, enlightening lyrics, and it all combines to form a music with enough heart and soul to move a generation. Tyson See, when you do that, I, then uh -oh. people be like, can the dude rhyme? You know what I'm saying? The I little mean, bio is one thing. You want to, I mean, you want to drop something for us real quick. We'll take it. Uh, yeah, I mean, because now it is necessary. It has to be done. So, all right. Uh, all right, I'll spit, I'll spit this piece right here. So this is um, this is off of the second album that I have with my my production partner. His name is Fanatic on Beats, and it's a piece called Tradition. Actually, the project is called Tradition. So this is the title track. I'll just do the first verse. It says, "I we on mission trying to carry on tradition." You see, I know the government, listen, they fighting for extradition. They're wishing my right to the First Amendment be rescinded. Cause when I'm pinning these lyrics, the brothers and sisters in tenements hear it. They look in the mirror, they start feeling Phyllis. They follow me marching down the block. Marcus Garvey appearing in the flesh for the second time. It's red, black, and green on the crest, black star line. We've been oppressed because they've been obsessed. They've been trying to suppress this intellect since Imhotep, the architect, but we stay building. I'm on my Benjamin Banneker, Lewis H. Latimer, giving them light, the reason they mad at us. They prefer in the shadow while we shine in immaculate. They're green with envy, cause they can't manufacture it. Got the African continent on my amulet feet, color of burned brass like Jesus of Nazareth. Every revolution needing a catalyst from the passages of spook who sat by the door, the protagonists are moving like I'm Sam Green League in green fatigues while these Uncle Tom Kermit sipping their green tea. While in these mean streets, the beast just want to feast. He just pulled up his seat, unfold his handkerchief. It's like dinner is served, Monsieur Bon Appetit. The judges, the police, the government on the sneak. The saga never ceased. The cycle on repeat. The enemy on the creep. The torch was passed to me. I'm trying to carry on tradition for my people to be free. Let's get free. Man, y'all get y'all in the chat. I don't know. Put some put some snaps up there. Some. I mean, I talk that real shit, but Tyson dropped those real bars. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> he is definitely, definitely. He says he's a rapper. He's. A, I mean, that's that's not a rap. That's like you are a lyricist. Like that was dope. That was dope. Uh, I appreciate that. But I'm saying when the 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 sometimes the bios that they read, I'm like, well, if you say it, I got to do it because right. you can't just say that and not demonstrate. I feel you. I feel you gotta, you know, show them who you are, all sides mm -hmm. of you. We appreciate Definitely. that. I mean, if you wanna, did you did you plug the piece? Did you plug that the album? Oh, it's good. You know what I'm saying it's it <laughs> it is what it is. If okay. if people follow me or they they connect to my work, they'll be able to see that stuff anywhere. Okay. You know. All right. Well, again, as y'all can see, he's a real rapper, real lyricist. <laughs> um, <laughs> But in addition to that, he's also a poet, an MC, an educator, author, activist. But if you ask him, he'll say he's a freedom fighter. Definitely. His fight is born out of love for humanity, justice, and peace for all. Each one of these layers are intricately woven into his praxis and practice. Praxis and practice. Yeah, I'm, I'm. Y'all welcome our, our brother, activist, powerful black man, Mr. Tyson Amir. Appreciate that. It's good to be here for real. And I, I hope the, the demonstration, uh, you know, sets well, gives us a proper foundation for, for building on the conversation, especially because I know we might talk about some stuff a little later on regarding some curriculum things and like hip hop pedagogy with curriculum. You got to be you got to be authentically of the thing in order to do it and to turn it into that. You know what I'm saying? So. Right. 
we try to do that in a very real way. And from the, the tradition that I come from being from the Bay Area, so originally born and raised in San Jose, mm -hmm. and that's important for my Bay Area brothers and sisters who've been in here, like our geography is is essential to who we are. So having that South Bay experience, but being connected to the East Bay and of course to San Francisco and Peninsula, all of that, like we, we've done some really powerful things here, socially, culturally, politically, creatively, artistically, and I have benefited from the brothers and sisters that came before me. Mm -hmm. And I try to carry that tradition on. Yeah, yeah. So talk about Tyson, talk about where that, <clears throat> how all of that was like nurtured in you? Like, where did it start? Let's talk about your upbringing, um, mm -hmm. specifically the struggles that you face as a youth and just a black boy. Cause we, cause the, the topic of the conversation and a lot of, a lot of the conversations that you have and the curriculum that you have is talking about with black boys. And so mm -hmm. overall, we wanna push this campaign and humanize black boys. And so talk about your upbringing and struggles as a black boy. No doubt. So the history, I think is important. So my mother, she originally from Mississippi. I come from six, seven generations of folks from Mississippi. And Mississippi, we know, uh, you know, our our ancestor Nina Simone. She had the song "Mississippi Goddamn." Mm -hmm. uh, Mississippi was rough. It was hard, and the ways that it treated our people, it treated indigenous folk. And then my father, he came from Pennsylvania, so he was from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. My father and mother, they meet up in the Sacramento area in California. And then eventually late sixties, early seventies, they come to the Bay area. So I have an older sister. So her and I both were born in the Bay area, okay. but with roots in the South, on the East, all of that. And then came to the Bay area. What attracted my folks to the Bay area was of course, the political and the revolutionary activity that was happening centered around the Black Panther party, the Black Panther party being founded in Oakland, California on October 15th, 1966. So my father, he participated in the Sacramento chapter of the Black Panther Party, which was located in Oak Park, Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And so late 60s, early 70s, they come down here and all of that becomes part of the foundation for my sister and I, because the elders that you know were raising us up, they were exposed to all of those different things. And they wanted to make sure that as the next generation coming up, we had that tied to our history our culture, our tradition, especially the revolutionary aspects of it. And I'm thankful for that. That became uh, a very important part of my foundation. And then being raised up in the eighties, I'm having, you know, the OG folks in the neighborhood exposing me to hip hop. So I get this revolutionary understanding of my history. I'm getting this, this really dope, beautiful cultural artifact that's, that's blossoming in the community and putting all that stuff together and then using that to navigate what's going on in the Bay Area. So being from San Jose, San Jose historically has never really had a big black community, but we put a black community together for the folks who were there. And being, uh, having a very small population, San Jose was a, a, a new city, but more conservative than other aspects of how the Bay Area is described. And then San Jose being the birthplace of what people refer to as Silicon Valley or like the new tech industry that was a very strong conservative streak there. We had to navigate a lot of that. And I mean, when it comes to school, when it comes to just different institutions that existed in San Jose and how those things discriminated against black people, that stuff was real. I witnessed that, but having a community behind me, I benefited from that. And I know that's not the experience that all of our brothers and sisters have throughout the country, but I benefited from having a strong, well-informed community that came from a revolutionary tradition. And so when something impacted an individual in the community, we raised up as a collective. Mm -hmm. And so seeing that was very important to me to create, if I was gonna be in a space, never allowing something like that to visit an individual in our community alone, you were gonna feel the full force of the community responding to that. Yeah, yeah. So you talked about Obviously, those things inspire you to become a rapper, an author, an activist, an MC, right? So why black boys? Well, let me ask you this question. Why do you think black boys are America's most wanted? Mm -hmm. I mean, with that, right, I think it's a. All right. So part of it in 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 the curriculum that I developed for black boy poems, I have 
a section based on a poem that I wrote entitled Between Huey and Malcolm. So Huey co-founded the Black Panther Party and of course Malcolm, our dear brother, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. And in that, one of the pieces that I, I bring about in the curriculum is focusing on the COINTELPRO memo that came out on March 4th, 1968. Mm -hmm. And the first point talking about prevent the coalition of these black groups, because if they come together, there's unity and strength, they become much stronger. And then the second point talking about prevent the, the rise of a Messiah who can unify and electrify the black masses. Right. So using that as a historical reference, and we know that same fear has existed in this power structure before 1968, the mm -hmm. fear of the, the power of our people unifying and rising up to overthrow these people who are responsible for the exploitation and the oppression that we experience on a daily basis. I mean, it goes back to the Haitian Revolution. It goes back even before that into the 1700s and the, the 1600s, all of that. So the, the black man or the black boy, but as well the black woman and the black girl They've been afraid of us since day one because they know that we have the power, we have the moral and the ethical right to unify people and the, the desire and the drive to execute that, to create a different society that is gonna be about the freedom and the liberation of the people. They know that, you know what I'm saying? And, and they don't delude themselves in their understanding of that. And that's part of the reason why, whether we're talking about COINTELPRO, and how COINTELPRO has evolved into the present day, the black identity extremists, whatever it is, like they, they will brand it how they brand it. And this is also reflected in what we see with these, what they refer to as extrajudicial killings of our brothers and sisters by agents of the state. Like mm -hmm. they, they are terrified of us, especially yeah. us when we have an understanding of who we are. We have an understanding of our desire for our people to be free and a plan that is disciplined and organized to execute that and make that a reality. Right. Because when we move that way, indigenous brothers and sisters, they gonna rock with us. You know what I'm saying? Our brothers and sisters that come from other communities are gonna see that and be inspired by that. And that changes the whole game. Yeah. They can't have that. That's why they terrified terrified of that. And that's why they target black men and they target black women and our brothers and sisters who identify outside of that as well when we have that true understanding of who we are and what we should be trying to accomplish. But when we on some other stuff, they ain't afraid of us. Right. Because we ain't no threat to them. Right, right, right. So how have those ideologies manifested themselves in our public school system? And mm -hmm. how is your curriculum working to kind of dismantle that those systems? I appreciate that. that. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So one thing I want to add to that is, so my work is entitled Black Boy Poems. And sometimes people, they assume that the work is something that I created specifically for Black boys and Black men. It's not. Mm -hmm. I entitled the work Black Boy Poems because the author that inspired me to write is Richard Wright. His autobiography is entitled Black Boy. Mm -hmm. So in what I call my colonial educational experience, so elementary school, middle school, high school, college, university, I was never, never inspired to want to write. I never thought about being an author. But you know what I'm saying? Since the age of five, six, I'm rhyming. So I'm writing and I'm creating in my own way. But I never viewed myself as, mm, you know what I'm going to write a book one day. Mm -hmm. But in revisiting the work of my elder, Richard Wright, after rereading his book in 2015, when I finished it, I'm like, I got to do something like this for my day and my time to speak to what is happening to us now and also to focus on what he was talking about because he was focused on the freedom and liberation of his people. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I could do that and I could do it in a way that fit the 21st century. And that's why the hip hop and the spoken word had to be featured in the work. So I did that and I knew when I had that idea, I was also gonna create the curriculum for the book. So I, you know, I have some experience teaching in schools in different parts of the country and they want to label us. So if I want to speak about black boys, but I can speak about just black folks in general as, you know, the most learning deficient when it comes to reading and writing, when it comes to math and science, we're brilliant. But the way that the education system is set up, so get into your, your, your question, it ain't, they ain't trying to empower us. They ain't trying to develop learning experiences 
that are culturally relevant and culturally responsive that are gonna allow us to see our history, that are gonna allow us to have an understanding of ourselves and the world around us and how we can impact that. They ain't focused on that. So I said, I'm gonna create a curriculum that does that. And I gave you an example of the COINTELPRO memo from March 4th, 1968. That's in the fifth chapter of the curriculum, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like when are you gonna be taught about COINTELPRO in your school experience? And then analyzing what they do and analyzing how we should be responding in a revolutionary way to what the state is trying to do to impact our community and our movements and our leaders. You know what I'm saying? Right. So in, in the curriculum, I'm trying to impart the knowledge, the wisdom, or create a foundation for our young people to engage in learning experiences that are going to teach them about themselves, teach them about the power that they have in order to impact their community in a positive and a revolutionary way and that's like the driving philosophy behind the curriculum that i developed and it's it's so powerful to see it manifesting in the lives of young people and seeing more school systems picking up this curriculum and using it and you know it, it came from i'm not going to wait for the school system to the, the the school system that created the problems in the first place to to correct those problems. Right. I'm gonna go ahead and start developing what needs to be developed right now and put that out there so our young people have what they need. Right, right. And I mean, the thing, <laughs> it's funny because I'm rarely, I'm rarely like speechless. You know, if y'all watch TDRS, I'm, I'm literally always talking shit, but Tyson is one of those people that, you know, that learn you some stuff in the moment, you know, especially <laughs> around history, <laughs> like seriously, you know, um, because, Everybody, all black people can definitely stand to learn more about our history because history, there's power in all history. Time. Yeah. So, you know, it's like when you when you talk and I'm just like in tune, like I'm in class, you know, um, Sunday school. Well, actually, let's say hum day school. But um, <laughs> yeah. So when we when we think about the traditional system and, you know, basically how it was designed to fail our kids and we have mm -hmm. liberation tools, which is your curriculum. How can that tool be used to combat some of the issues that we see now, like with police brutality, specifically with the criminalization of black boys and girls in our schools committed mm -hmm. by SROs and this mm -hmm. whole, this overall issue of this just like ridiculous election? Like, I know y'all saw the debate last night. That was trash. It was an embarrassment on our country. And really, at the end of the day, we lost because this is what we're left with. So how can that curriculum be used to combat all these issues that we are facing as black people? Um, I think it it speaks to, to all of that in a very clear, authentic, and unapologetic way. So what I try to present in the curriculum, and it's not about bias or, or preference, it's about making sure that young people have a sound understanding of the reality of this historical, social, cultural, and political experience that we've all been thrust into. We got to have a critical analysis of it. And once we do that, that should drive us to react in a revolutionary way. That's what I'm hoping. So I give them a breakdown of how these systems work, whether we're talking about the political system and uh, this, this three branch government, executive, legislative, judicial, what it looks like on a state level, what it looks like locally and how from the colonial period up and through the constitutional period, these things have operated in a similar way and they've been weaponized against the black community and other communities of color. So if this is the reality that we're dealing with, we can try to find out how to strategically use our influence to push back against those institutions or to create change within those institutions. But where does our freedom and liberation ultimately lie? It lies in us being a self-determining people that develop our own institutions. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's key. And that's not something that's going to be taught in any colonial educational system because the focus of those colonial educational systems is to continue to perpetuate themselves and to get people like us, black faces, brown faces, faces that, you know what I'm saying, whether you want to identify outside of the gender binary, you know what I'm saying, like whoever you are, to keep perpetuating that exact same system. That's yeah. the focus of the colonial educational project. We don't get free through that. We have to develop our own independent things. So through the curriculum that you know I, I've developed and other programs that we have, 
they're going to get a sound understanding of that. They're going to get that critical analysis, but they're also going to get an understanding of the power that we have to demonstrate by becoming a self-determining people with mm -hmm. independent institutions. Mm -hmm. And that's there. And if we're not doing that, then I believe that we're really setting up, setting our the next generation or our young people up for failure because we're saying the only option is for you to find out how to assimilate into the system that is responsible for all these problems in the first place. Right. So then when we're talking about SROs or we're talking about other aspects of the educational community, it's the same thing. We are able to demonstrate our power when we're able to organize and develop our own independent institutions and use those to have impact or use those to, to create more momentum behind changing what is going on in the existing institution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, but then uh, another key part of that is the power in our people when we organize. So if we're talking about SROs and when they get SROs out as individual voices, we're not going to be successful in doing that. Mm -hmm. But as a unified community, we can be successful in doing that. But still, where does the freedom lie for our people? We need to have our own schools, but that's not yeah. what's happening. You know what I'm saying? And we need to be taking those steps to do that. So in my mind, going back to you know one of the earlier questions, when I wrote the book, I knew I was gonna write the curriculum because I knew the curriculum would be a part of addressing the current reality in schools, but also moving to this other step of when we have, when we have the opportunity to build our own schools, we're gonna need a curriculum. So that curriculum will be part of that. So mm -hmm. it was, let's create the content, Let's deal with the current reality and let's build for the future of our people, which is establishing our own independent educational institutions, our own independent healthcare institutions, our own independent financial institutions that allow us to be self-determining, free and liberated. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have so many questions. I'm going to try to remember them all um, because it's like my mind just went everywhere. But I want to know how the students that are are in that are have been able to um, learn through the curriculum, how are they responding? Because again, through that assimilation, a lot mm -hmm. of kids they're learning this, this patriotic, you know, yeah, history yeah. Of America, and they're not seeing themselves in that history and it's disengaging. And so they already have this idea that learning about history is boring. You know, yeah. it's they don't see themselves in that history. So how are they responding to your curriculum? I'm just day and night for me as, it's off top. People recognize it like, oh, oh, we, we getting some real information now. OK, you know what I'm saying? They are hands on the chin, all in notes ready to go, you know, phone out, taking pictures of whatever we got up on the screen. They, they're, they're there for that because it is it's what our people have been waiting for. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like we we recognize it when we go into these spaces and, you know, I'm generalizing, but it's when you get this content, all right, yeah, Christopher Columbus did this, George Washington was this, Thomas Jefferson was this, and whoever else they want to talk about and throw these names in there, uh, freaking um, whoever else they want to put up there, uh, Kennedy was this, and come on now. Right, right. This, this, ain't, this ain't the reality of the situation for us. The Emancipation Proclamation really freed people. Come on, what? Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, you, you feel it time and time again, and you might even get desensitized to it because that colonial brainwashing is an everyday project that they operate. So then when young people get exposed, I, I can't tell you the, the, the power in seeing the responses of young people when I'm like, all right, this memo came from the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. We can go to the website right now, I'll show you where it's in their documents. Mm -hmm. J. Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the FBI at the time, did this, sent this out to this many uh, FBI headquarters throughout the United States. The FBI, of course, being funded by the federal government. So this was a government program. And then having young people read that line by line and they'd be like, what? They, they really said this? They really about this? Oh, yeah, it makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Because we, we, we've seen stuff like this before, the connections that begin to happen. And then we take it to the next step. So then what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. How do we empower ourselves when we know this is the reality that our communities are being faced with? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when they get real stuff like that, it changes the entire conversation. Yeah. I mean, hands is going up. People, oh, wait, but why they do this? What they, we get so much more. I mean, the learning, it's, it's easy. And then, you know, even how I started the thing with the, with the bio and then I hit you with the bars. 
Like, I know I, I got bars, but not like bragging about it. Like, I'm thankful. This is something that my ancestors passed on to me. And right. so it's important to wield that, that creativity with the responsibility that it deserves. So I know I've been given that and I use that. So imagine that, right? Imagine a learning space where the first thing that you get is that verse that I gave you, that tradition verse. They're going to be asking, oh, what's the Black Star line? What, who, who's Imhotep? Mm -hmm. Oh, you said Marcus Garvey appearing for the second time. You said Louis H. Latimer, Benjamin Banneker. What, what's the spook who sat by the door? You know what I'm saying? Just because it's being delivered in a way that makes more sense culturally. So we already building. Yeah. Then we go to the next thing, right? I could be like, oh, all right. So remember in the verse when we was talking about Marcus Garvey. So before there was an FBI. So the predecessor to the FBI was, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but J. Edgar Hoover, he was the head of that. The first undercover agents that were hired that were black to infiltrate a black organization were hired to infiltrate Marcus Garvey's UNIA. Oh, what, for real? You know what I'm saying? So we're making all these connections and the learning is going, but then we keep going to, so what are we going to do? Because yeah. we talking about this was happening in 1918, 1919 with Marcus Garvey. We 100 years later and we still dealing with the same situation. Yep. So what are we going to do different, y'all? Yep. And then folks coming up with ideas, we begin to organize, we put stuff together. It's powerful. So yep. that's a very long answer. But I'm saying when you bring that type of information into a learning space with our young people, they going to see it instantly. They recognize it. They get inspired by it. They engage. They think critically. That's everything that we want them to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I apologize for looking down. Y'all, I was actually trying to share this broadcast on my Facebook page because people definitely need to tune in. Like this is real knowledge being dropped. And I want to, I want to jump into something that's been egging me a little bit. Um, the Black Lives Matter organization. I want to hear your opinion on it because you you talked a little bit about, uh, well, not a little bit about, you talked about self-determination and the need for us to unite as a people to, mm -hmm. to fruition. And so when you think about Black Lives Matter as an organization versus the Black Lives Matter movement for liberation, how mm -hmm. are those things, do you think there's a difference? Definitely. Um, yeah, talk just, Tyson, please. Give me, go in on that for me. Uh -huh. I, you know, I'm, I might go in a little delicately on that, <laughs> but it's, we have, we have a very strong historical record that we should be very well aware of when it comes to what a revolutionary movement or revolutionary organization is and those characteristics. And we can do like a brief overview of that stuff. But if we, if we were to go back to looking at the example of our brothers and sisters for the Haitian revolution, mm -hmm. that's a revolutionary movement that achieved a revolutionary outcome. Now, not everything has done that, but still there are characteristics that are important and that's why we have to be in tune with our history. If we're saying we're about the freedom and the liberation of our people and we're trying to accomplish that by any revolutionary means possible. Mm -hmm. So then if we fast forward from the Haitian revolution, like we can look at the, the revolutionary movement of our brothers and sisters, 1811, who were trying to overthrow and free themselves in Louisiana. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? That's one of the movements that people are not necessarily familiar with. Again, very important characteristics that are similar between what happened in Haiti, what was happening there. If we could talk about Nat Turner, we can talk about what our sister Harriet was doing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They're very clear things. We could fast forward and we can move into Booker, Booker T. Washington and what he was trying to accomplish with the Tuskegee machine. We can talk about Marcus Garvey's organization. We can talk about the nation of Islam. We can fast forward from there and we can look at what Malcolm was doing after he left the nation. We can talk about the Black Panther Party. We can talk about some of what SNCC and SCLC was doing. You had clear structures of organization and leadership. That's very key. Without that, you have anybody popping up and saying, yeah, I'm SCLC, I'm SNCC, I'm this, I'm that. There has to be some type, and I'm not saying the leadership has to be in the hands of a dude, it ain't that, you feel me? Because our movements have also reflected that as well. But there has to be some leadership structure, whatever that is. And that leadership structure has to have influence over whatever that organization is gonna be. So like when the Black Panther Party started in 66, by the time we get to 67, when Huey gets arrested, 
and that leads to the Free Huey campaign, you get chapters of the Black Panther Party popping up all over the United States. People just putting on a beret and a leather coat saying, I'm in the Panthers. Nah, they had a process for being able to see whether y'all were real or you were fake. And if you were fake, there ain't no Panther chapter there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's a way to try to instill a, a standard for what is supposed to happen with the revolutionary ideology and how that revolutionary ideology is going to manifest. And another thing that's key in all of that, like people have to be able to have access to you. You can't just exist in one realm, you feel me? And that was a conversation that, especially in the movements in the 60s, you had, should there just be above ground organizing or should there only be underground organizing what was supposed to happen? And that was a, a theoretical point that folks had to work out. And that was important because you have to be available. You know what I'm saying? You have to be a tangible resource in the community. So when we're looking at some of the stuff that happens with Black Lives Matter, for many of us, we don't know who the people are. And I'm not saying that means that they're agents, you feel me? Like you gotta be able to touch the people. Like, who are you? Where are you at? And then how are you doing something to impact the day-to-day -day experiences of black folks? We can't just show up when something happens and a, a police officer kills a black person. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Housing, food insecurity, you know what I'm saying? School stuff that's going on all the ways that our people are being impacted by the various institutions of the United States of America, which, you know what I'm saying, the Nate, like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, him saying the white man is the devil for 40 plus years, you feel me? Like mm -hmm. that reflected a critical analysis of the way that these systems and institutions have been weaponized against us. Right. He was trying to say, this is the highest form of evil out here and they're, they're using it to impact our community. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So there has to be, a, a way to address the day-to-day -day experiences of the people. And if you're not doing that, then how are we moving the agenda for the freedom and the liberation of the people? You know what right. I'm saying? Right. And that's what, when we're looking at that historical record of what our people have done century after century, when we're talking about revolutionary organizations and revolutionary movements, we've had to address all those societal contradictions to the best of our ability. And then also pushing for independence and self-determination when it comes to the new institutions that we're creating. So with Black Lives Matter, there are certain positives, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Like information is getting out. You yeah. do have people who are being inspired to wanna do something. Right. But now, where's, the, where's the, the structure? Where's the organization? How is it being standardized? Like right here in, in, in California, you have a couple different chapters in different parts of Northern California. Mm -hmm. Like some people are active doing something, some folks ain't doing anything. Like right. there, there has to be some standardized way of that. And then also focusing on the everyday, day-to-day -day experiences of black folks and moving an agenda of freedom and liberation, creating independent institutions. SCLC had the institutions, SNCC had institutions, the Black Panther Party built multiple institutions, survival programs, pending revolution, you know what I'm saying? All right, y'all yeah. need schools, we gonna create schools. We got health clinics. We out here doing sickle cell testing. We over here, uh, clothing factories, shoe factories, electric companies. I mean, all this was part of the Black Panther program, but these were, let's address the current need, let's get our people strong so we can fight in the future to really become free and liberated. UNIA had multiple programs, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if Black Lives Matter is trying to move in that direction, then we could potentially see the revolutionary power that they may hold. But as of now, there are too many pieces that are missing from the way that Black Lives Matter has operated over the past few years, mm -hmm. which make it something that is not a revolutionary organization for Black folks. And then nowadays, you know what I'm saying, especially with marches and stuff, you're getting a whole bunch of white folks who are out there. White folks ain't going to save black people. Right, right. You know I'm saying? And then you yeah. have to be able to organize black folk. Mm -hmm. And Black Lives Matter, does Black Lives Matter really organize black folk? Especially like the Black Panther Party focused on saying, we're trying to organize the brothers and sisters on the block. So mm -hmm. using a Marxist Leninist understanding, that would be talking about like the lumpen proletariat. Mm -hmm. So the people who were like the, the cast off or the, you know, the, the lowest on the totem pole in the Marxist analysis of the class system, mm -hmm. the lumpen proletariat. We gonna organize our brothers and sisters who are, in the, who are in the mud and keep them moving forward on a revolutionary agenda. Yeah. The hashtag don't go that far. Right.
know what I'm saying? Right. We got to we got to come off Twitter. You got to come off Instagram. You got to come off TikTok. You got to come off Snapchat. You got to come off Facebook and you got to meet with real folk and support your people in the everyday struggles. And then let's unify for a revolutionary agenda, build our independent institutions and move forward. And if we ain't talking about that, then we ain't really talking about revolution for the people. You're right. We talking right. something else. Yeah. Because you know what? Activism has become, I don't know. I don't think any of us woke up. Just you talked earlier about, you know, your upbringing and how you were inspired to ultimately grow into an author and a poet and an activist. You know, none of us were 11 years old or in our high school yearbook saying, I want to become an activist. Like it's born out of passion and it's born out of need and it's, it's born out of selflessness, you know? And so we're living now in an age where activism is romanticized. And so that yeah, we have, you know, so many, we have um, so many people who are now Black Lives Matter activists, you know, and not for the liberation of Black lives. And I just want to touch on that because I don't think it's a conversation that we have enough and mm -hmm. uh, how detrimental it is to the actual movement for the liberation of Black lives. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to get your opinion on that. I, you know, I told you I can pull some random questions out and that was one of them, but. Um, All right, I'm, I stay ready for me. And yeah, yeah, my yeah. bad, my my opinion ran for about five minutes on that no, one. No, it's but, good, it's good. You know. That's what we need. You know, I think we need, again, more people to sound off on that. So we appreciate you um, giving your input. Yeah. So. Right on. Just to switch gears a little bit. Um, okay. A, a, a film called Black Boys recently came out and it was again about, it was part of the, the campaign to humanize black boys. And mm -hmm. someone who works closely with black students and black boys and you, you've written um, the poem and de developed the curriculum. What was your take on the film? All right, we, we still good based on our previous conversation. Yep. I could. <laughs> <laughs> do your thing. All right. Uh, I mean, you know, as a, as a, as a work, I think there are some important points that get covered in the film. Mm -hmm. But as I was saying before, and being as honest as I can be, that's just the way that I roll. When I was watching the film, I, I halfway through the film, I was like, I think this was made by somebody who's white. Mm. And then at the end of it, you know, I came out to be the truth because the way that our story was being framed mm -hmm. when it's being reduced to humanizing black boys black men black people we don't need that you feel me like in in many ways that is the the narrative of black lives matter mm. i don't need white people i don't need whoever to see the value in me as a people i don't need that you know what i'm saying our and again in the historical experience of our people and the revolutionary focus of many of our movements and our organizations we in, we don't need that that's not what we was after Right. He's after freedom and liberation. You can, whether you see my value or whatever your opinion is of me or of somebody else, I, that's not necessary. That's mm -hmm. not part of the agenda. Mm -hmm. So the the agenda to humanize black boys, black men, black people, I, I don't need that, yeah. but I want my people to be free. You know what I'm saying? And that's, I had mentioned the poem between Huey and Malcolm before and the very, the very first line of the piece, I say, uh, Dr. Huey P. Newton, well, I say Huey P. Newton had an epiphany once and he said, I don't expect the white media to create positive black male images. Right. I'm saying he could, he also says positive black images. Mm -hmm. I don't expect this institution to see the value in us. They only did that when they were able to commodify us and they've been doing that throughout mm -hmm. our existence in their system. Uh, yeah. A black body is worth a hundred, Five hundred, a thousand dollars on the auction block, and now we got black bodies going for millions of dollars playing professional sports for all these different teams. That's them. I don't need them to see my value. I'm already valuable. Our people are already valuable. So in the film, a lot of the conversation was about that, and then you know there's some other things too. Love black boys, of course. Support, mentor. Don't. That's a given. We have to, and that's something that we in general. We just need to get back to that collective understanding of handling our business for the sake of our people. And that doesn't mean only men take the leadership roles in that. Our, we, were, we were thrust into this as a community experience, uh, dealing with this uh, exploitation and oppression, the forced enslavement of our ancestors. We can only survive it as a collective as well. And everybody has a role to play. And it's important for us to understand what our role is to play 
and then play that. And then at times that role is going to shift depending on the conditions as well. So when I was watching the film, as I was saying, I was like, mm, I think this was created by somebody who wasn't of our people because mm -hmm. the way that the story was being framed mm -hmm. and the, the, the points that were focused on and all throughout that, like in our conversation, even though our conversation wasn't even, this wasn't a conversation about freedom and liberation of black people, how often has that come up? That's been in a response to every single question. No time in that film did they talk about what do we do to fight for the freedom and liberation of our people? It was, let's love black boys while this system is still exploiting and killing them. Let us try to mentor black boys while this system is still killing them and killing us every day. Let's not think about independent this, ind none of that came up because again, that's not gonna be the narrative if the narrative is not coming from our people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because how can we deal with supporting black boys if we're not talking about the system that's creating the problem that's impacting black boys, black girls, black people on a daily. You're trying to compartmentalize the conversation in a way that makes absolutely no sense. And so the film had that as a major deficiency. And so as I'm watching, I'm like, dang, okay, yeah, I, I love seeing my brothers in Philadelphia doing what they're doing at the school, some powerful stuff going on. Mm -hmm. There was a focus on African-American male achievement program here in Oakland, there's some powerful stuff going on with that. You know what I'm saying? Stuff that's going on in Chicago. I love that. It's good to see our folks doing stuff, but we have to be operating with the revolutionary agenda. You know what I'm saying? And that just was not part of the formula of the film at all. And so I yeah. saw that and I was like, mm, all right. And that's what made me think this was created by somebody that wasn't part of our community experience, our historical experience. And it turned out to be the case. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to have that conversation and, you know, give that feedback because we have to learn our allies too, you know, um, but one um, to bring this all together. So when you talk about Obviously, you know, you're not supportive of the language of the of humanized black boys or humanized black people. Um, black Lives Matter the organization is a little problematic. And well, well, I don't know what the organization is. You feel me? That's <laughs> right, part of the right, right. problem. So it's just like just, just kind of like scattered gangs or something. I don't I only want let me sign gangs was the wrong language. My bad, y'all. Let me scrap that. But just scattered groups calling themselves Black Lives Matter with different agendas and no united agenda. So mm -hmm. if you can bring all this stuff together, if you can, if you can scrap the language of humanized black boys or black people, and we created a um, a united front for the liberation of black lives. What is it going to take to get there? And what is our agenda, in your opinion? I mean, the historical record already gives us that. So depending on I mean, who you want to get it from, if you want to get it from what the brothers and sisters in the SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference were about with Dr. King and the, the, the Poor People's Campaign, we can go there and we can get some powerful stuff. If you wanna get it from SNCC before SNCC disbanded, we can get it from them. If you wanna get it from RAM, Revolutionary Action Movement, there was some powerful stuff there. If you wanna get it, and you know, I'm, I'm from the Bay Area, so the history of the Black Panther Party is very strong in what I've understood and what I try to practice, we can get it from those brothers and sisters. You know what I'm saying? Like, our historical record is very rich with that type of understanding. We don't need to recreate a lot. The conditions are different in 2020. They'll be different in 2021, but the principles, the theories, those themes, those ideas, the agenda of freedom and liberation for our people is key. And then another thing that I don't think we talk about enough is like, we gotta become every person, every black person, should know how to defend themselves, defend their family, defend their community. You need to be trained in some martial science. You need to understand how to use weapons, you know what I'm saying, collectively as well. All of that. Like we can't we can't play with the game, fam. This is what's happening every single day in our community. We need to know how to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. These people have weaponized every institution they've created against us. Deal with the reality. Prepare yourself. That doesn't mean that we wage in some violent military uprising right now but know how to defend yourself, know how to defend your family, know how to defend your community and know how to be organized. Those are key things. And our historical record demonstrates that. The power of us coming together, being unified and knowing how to protect one another. And then let's build our independent institutions as well. We cannot find freedom and liberation under the constitution of the United States, under the Supreme Court, in that we can't. This thing is not built for that. 
we have to build something else for ourselves if we're talking about freedom and liberation. So the people have to come together. We have to get unified. And the young people are a very important part of that because we know pretty much every single revolutionary movement has been carried by the youth. So what we can do to support our young people, knowing what our role is in being a part of that, making sure that they know how to defend themselves, defend their families, defend their communities, have a, a, a revolutionary focus, are building programming to become self-determining in terms of institutions and systems, that's key. Yeah. And we're not, we're not there. We're really not there. We've been put on this path of white supremacist capitalistic individualism where we think that individual success over here, getting this house, getting this nice little paycheck, becoming famous in their institution or in their industry is, is what's going to liberate black people. That ain't, that ain't done nothing, fam. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And if you, if you have obtained a level of personal success, that's cool. You still have a responsibility to do for the collective and to do for the community. And we've been disconnected when it comes to that. So we have to get back to that. And I believe the way that our young people are operating right now, they have the ability to build that foundation of power of the, the, the what the Black Panther Party was talking about, all power to the people, power to the people, let's unify the people and let's move with that unified understanding and focus on tangible manifestations of change that are impacting the conditions of our community. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. without that, I don't know what we're doing. Yeah. Oh man, y'all will. Tyson, thank you so much. I don't know about y'all, but I am full on this Wednesday um, listening to, to Tyson talk about his work and what we need to do as Black people to, to achieve that self-determination, that liberation. Um, but yeah, um, again, Tyson, thank you so much. Tyson Amir, educator, MC, activist, rapper. You want to leave us with something or you just- you Oh, get, for real? Uh, yeah, I mean- I mean <laughs> I got you. I told you we stay ready, so it's good. Like, if you want me to, I can. Hey, go for, I mean, for the one time, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'll hit y'all with this. Uh, so a, a song that I released recently is called Black Mirror, and I'll give you the second verse of that one. I, I think I got it all the way memorized. So the second verse starts, at times I wonder how we looking through Malcolm's eyes by any means necessary. That can't be overemphasized, but some niggas only wanna be legendary on that list of hip hop's top five. While them cops beat the homies to they dome lopsided, and then they drop five in they back. We watching it, making comments on IG live. What your streams gotta do with us getting free? Do you only see your value through the masters industries? While the homie Kaepernick was willing to risk it all on the bended knee. Ain't no permanent friends or permanent enemies. That's permanent principle and our principle is getting free. But this minstrel show that we see through our live feed, courtesy of that FBIG, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, social media complex, artificial intelligence algorithms, global facial recognition systems, and we just trying to jailbreak a fire stick. Download the latest apps and get some followers, but they capture our data and follow us. Weaponize the environment to swallow us. They do it all for that in God we trust. They ungodly, it's so obvious. Our only option is to go Mugabe. Them Zanu soldiers up in the lobby. Minister self-defense, Huey P. Newton and Chairman Bobby. Mixing some chair with some Cabral and some Gaddafi, you got me? That's Black Mirror. Ooh, man. Y'all follow Tyson and me on his social media, on his on his social media channel channels. So y'all can, you know, check out some more of his work. In the meantime, Tyson, thank you again so much for coming on. And y'all keep your eyes on the Citizen Air Facebook page for the next activist spotlight where y'all find out that our activists really do walk it like they talk it. Um, y'all <laughs> peace out, enjoy your day, <laughs> and we'll get at y'all later. Thank you, Tyson. What's up? Peace. Power to the people. Yes.